Well, welcome to the Insectary Plants webinar today. Um, summertime is a great time for this webinar because the vegetable gardening season has slowed down and it's a good time to think about beneficial plants you can be planting in your garden, in your landscape, which will help you with a more ecological approach to your gardening. Um, many type of flowering plants bring in beneficial insects because they provide both pollen and nectar to help the insects reproduce and provide energy for them. And so um, this webinar today will be an overview of some different plants um, primarily suited for Florida, Florida gardens and Florida landscapes. And I hope you'll leave today with some ideas of more stuff to plant and learn a thing or two you can be incorporating into your home garden. So my name is Tia Silvesi, and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent for the University of Florida IFAS Extension in Orange County. So I'm based out of Orlando, Florida, and along with Erin, who's the Extension Agent up in Columbia County. And this program is brought to you today by the Victory Gardeners Program with the University of Florida IFAS Extension. And some of you might be part of our Victory Gardeners group on Facebook, and we have online modules that you can learn from. It is a free program, and Erin can put a link in the chat box if you're not a member already. It is a free program. It's free to sign up, and you can sign up and, and join us in our journey of growing vegetables and increasing your food security and your personal health and well being. So, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Your microphones have been set to mute, so use the chat box and that way you can say hello, ask questions, or make comments there. And there will be a survey after the webinar. Um, you can scan the QR code with your smartphone, or we'll put a link in the chat box. And it really helps us out um, to continue our programs if we, you know collect surveys and I hope you guys enjoy and we'll say that there. So here's me. My name is Tia Silvesi and I grew up in a farm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania where my grandparents were growing organically before organic was even called organic and ever since I was a kid I just loved plants, nature, I loved pulling carrots out of the ground and picking fresh raspberries off the bush. And so um, all of my jobs throughout my life has been um, in plant science. And I got my bachelor's degree here in Orlando at the University of Central Florida in environmental science. And I got my master's degree from the University of Hawaii in tropical plant and soil sciences. And I've been with the University of Florida doing research and extension for the past three years. And uh, University of Florida is a great entity to work for. I'm always surrounded by brilliant scientists and um, people like my collaborators, Aaron Harlow, and we're working on all kinds of great things. And, you know, trying to meet the needs of the public, of the community and the environment. And I just love nature and plants and growing food, native plants, butterfly plants, hummingbird plants, on and on. So we'll talk about a lot about plants today. So as I mentioned, I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent. And this program is a partnership between the University of Florida and the Department of Environmental Protection. And it's actually a water quality program. So by following the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping, you can help protect the environment by not wasting water and making sure fertilizer doesn't end up into our water bodies. And so what principles we're gonna talk to today is number five and six, which is attracting wildlife and managing yard pests. Because the use of insectary plants to attract beneficial insects um, that will help to attract butterflies, hummingbirds, and other kinds of insects and birds and creatures. And it also helps to manage yard pests that you might otherwise have to spray with a pesticide. So it can reduce 
your use of pesticides and thus increase our water quality with less chemicals. So what are insectary plants? So they're part of an integrated pest control program and they are plants grown to attract, feed, and shelter good bugs. And then they also provide pollen and nectar for insects, bees, and other pollinators. And that helps them reproduce and provide them with food and energy. So let me just review the integrated pest management um, strategy for a moment. Now, the insectary plants and beneficial insects are part of the biological control component, which you'll see here in the top right, the biological control. So there you're protecting and add natural enemies of pests. And so this is a really good thing to cultivate in your ecological garden letting nature do the work for you. That way we don't have to get to chemicals control. But it is still a good idea to use some physical control, you know, scouting, monitoring for pests, maybe hand squishing some of the bad ones. And also cultural control is important in your garden where you remove the conditions that sustain problematic insects. Like if you have rotting fruit beneath your tree, the best practice is to remove that fruit, put it in a compost pile where it can be covered up and broken down and doesn't become a breeding ground for problematic pests. So what are beneficial insects? If you don't have a degree in entomology, you may not be familiar with a lot of these insects. So they are pollinators or predators that feed on pests. And so most of you are probably familiar with the ladybug pictured in the top. And ladybugs are notorious for eating aphids. So one solution to your aphid problem is just wait until the ladybugs come and devour them. Another pest you may not, I mean, another beneficial insect you may not recognize in the bottom is the lacewing. So this is a small insect with a green body and very thin um, wings. And so that's another beneficial insect. And also the hoverfly pictured on the bottom right. So that's another aphid eater. Um, there's also parasitic wasps that often go after caterpillars. Um, praying mantises, my, minute pirate bugs, and Swirtsky mites. So I'm not going to go into these um, bugs in detail right now, um, but I'm more going to focus on the plants that you can use to attract these bugs. So let's talk about pests. So this is what we're trying to control or manage in our gardens. So what pests do these beneficial insects eat? Aphids, pictured in the top, are a food for many of the beneficial insects. Uh, so caterpillars, pictured on the bottom, and mealybugs, pictured on the right-hand side. Um, beneficial insects also eat mites, scale, and thrips, just to mention a few. So there's two primary ways that the beneficial insects work for us in the garden. On the left, you see the picture of the lacewing larvae preying on aphids. Now remember we saw the picture of the adult lacewing and it had the green body and the clearish wings. Well, this is a larval form of it. So they look differently. So there's a, not, a lot to know about insects and their different um, forms during their life cycle. And here, this lacewing larvae is eating an aphid bug. That's a great picture um, by Lyle Buss. He, he's our entomologist at, in, in Gainesville for the University of Florida. And that lacewing larvae just has that aphid and it's just chomping it up and eating it. So that's um, predator pest control at its finest. It's just going and chomping and eating it up. Now on the right, you'll see a parasitic wasp laying eggs into an armyworm caterpillar. And this is a little bit more complicated because the wasp will lay their eggs into the caterpillar and it won't kill the caterpillar immediately, 
but instead the eggs will hatch and it will kind of eat the caterpillar out from the inside. The caterpillar will actually be a host for the parasitic wasp eggs. And then you'll see the little um, white eggs coming out of the caterpillar. And so if you see a caterpillar with those white eggs sticking up out of it, then don't kill it because that is holding the baby parasitic wasps. So this um, insectary plan, biological pest control, it can get pretty complicated. Um, here is a list of um, insectary plants and the beneficial insects that those plants attract that was um, from the Rodell Institute. And so you can see, for example, the alyssum is good at attracting hoverflies. But if you have an aphid problem, you know, we have to find out, well, what then eats the aphids? And hoverflies do eat aphids. So it's kind of a multi-step process if you want to get really detailed with it. Um, my strategy is more just to plant a lot of beneficial insectary plants, and then you'll have a wide variety of beneficial insects to eat all your pests in your garden. So this next list here, this shows the beneficial insects and what pests that they eat. So using these two tables together, if you want to be detailed and target specific pests, like if you are a commercial um, vegetable grower, um, you might want to really target a specific pest with a specific beneficial insect and plant accordingly. Um, for example, hoverflies here, they attack aphids, um, small caterpillars, and also thrips. Um, so this list is very helpful and this recording will be available if you want to visit it later. But I won't spend too much time on this. Let's get into um, creating the habitat for beneficial insects. So to attract any type of wildlife, including insects to your yard, they need some basic things, food, water, and shelter. And so you can help provide what they need by planting a variety of flowering plants, especially ones that flower in different times of the year, the spring, the summer, the fall, the winter. Also plant the plants in groupings. So there's like a mass of color and that will help for them to see and come in to find your plants. Um, include both native and non-native plants because they flower at different times of the year and have different benefits. Um, most of the flowers like sun or part sun, but some of them also do well in shade. Um, provide a water source and eliminate or reduce the pesticides you use in your garden because pesticides can affect both good and bad bugs. And if you do have to spray pesticides, um, know the pests that you're going after and spray in a spot targeted area only. Avoid blanket spraying because then you can kill some of the good bugs. So today in this webinar, we're going to review some different types of insectary plants. And I have them categorized kind of by their growth habit. We have herbs, annuals, perennials, native plants, shrubs, trees, vines, also palms and grasses, which you might not realize how beneficial they are. And let me just give a disclaimer here that, you know, in some parts of Florida, what is a perennial in Orlando may be an annual up in Tallahassee or vice versa. So some of these lines are a little fuzzy, but you can check with your local extension agent or in your um, gardening groups and ask people what works well for them. Depending on what type of winters we get here in Central Florida will depend on whether some plants are an annual or a perennial for us. And let me also mention that there are some plants that provide very little wildlife value. So when you're going to the plant nursery and you pick up something that looks cool, think about, well, what is the ecological value of this plant? What is it gonna do for me in the garden? 
and what will it provide for the wildlife in my area? So some plants that provide little wildlife value are primarily ones with very few or small flowers, um, such as bromeliads. They have colorful foliage, but not a lot of flowers that can provide pollen or nectar for beneficial insects. Um, other plants like the croton, which is the, the bright yellow one behind that philodendron in the lower picture. Um, tea plants, um, pittosporum, um, these are all plants that are mainly grown for their foliage and don't have very many flowers. And so they're not very good at providing any wildlife value. Now let me move on to the herbs. So herbs are one of the best types of insectary plants because not only can you use them in your cooking and your little kitchen herb garden, but many herbs are very good for a host of beneficial insects. For example, the dill pictured here on the right, it has these umbrella shaped flowers. And so there's a lot of little flowers all over this umbel shaped flower. And that makes it really easy for the beneficial insects to go in and get the pollen and nectar out because the flowers are very shallow. And so it can host a wide range of beneficial insects to provide food. Um, also basil, all the flowers on basil is a great plant to attract beneficial insects. Parsley, um, parsley is a host for the swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. So you'll see it eating the leaves, but also if you let it flower, it has flowers similar to dill and is good for um, beneficial insects. Um, cilantro, also letting it flower, dill, let it flower. Um, and onion, onion flowers are the round and they just have tons of baby florets on them that provide a lot of food for wildlife. So the herbs, the message is to let them bolt and flower and then you can even save the seeds and replant, but it's the flowers of the herbs that help the beneficial insects and attract them to your garden. So next, let's talk about annuals. So annuals are usually short-lived, less than one year, and they're easy to grow in your garden. They're usually fast growing. They provide a lot of color. Um, some of the good annuals to grow are asters or calendula, cosmos, which is the pretty pink one pictured on the top, um, marigolds, phlox, sunflowers, and zinnia. Now, a lot of these are in the asteraceae family, and they call that little um, part in the center of the flower, that's like the butterfly landing pad. So they have little florets in the middle and the beneficial insects love those little florets. And so pictured on the bottom right is the zinnia and then pictured on the bottom left is a coreopsis or tick seed, but not the native one. So on to some native annuals. I know that I have a lot of native plant enthusiasts and I am one as well. And so, like I said, it's good to plant a mixture of native and non-native plants. And this helps to extend the flowering season and increase the number of beneficial insects that are coming to your garden. So some examples of native annuals that are excellent insectary plants are the Coreopsis, which is also known as the tick seed. Um, the blanket flower, which is also known as Gallardia, and that's pictured in the top right. Um, the blue mist flower that's blooming in my yard this spring. The beach dune flower, dune sunflower on the bottom picture, the yellow flower. And that is um, really native in our coastal areas, but it does do well inland, like places like Orlando or Ocala. And, a really hardy plant. Sometimes it's almost like uh, too hardy and wants to grow in a big mound and you have to tame it a little bit. Also the horse mint pictured in the top left and the butterfly milkweed. If you have uh, maybe sandy dry soil, you might want to try the orange butterfly milkweed 
which the scientific name is Asclepius tuberosa. And if you have more of an urban or a wet um, soil, if you have irrigation, you might wanna use the swamp milkweed, which is a pink flowered one, which is Asclepius incarnata. So you can find those at native plant nurseries. Um, sometimes you can find like the blanket flower, even at a big box kind of store. Um, I was at Lucas Nursery recently and they had the beach dune sunflower at their store. So if you look carefully, you can find some of these native plants at um, local nurseries, but often you have to go to a native plant nursery specifically to find them. So perennials that are good for insectary plants include African blue basil, and that is just a wonderful flowering plant that lives for a long time, and you can grow that from cuttings and give it out to all your friends and neighbors. Um, the black-eyed Susan, this is a cultivar of the native variety pictured here on the right. Uh, the butterfly bush, lantana, um, there are native and non-native types of lantana. The Mexican heather that gets the little pink flowers. Um, pentas are a perennial in central Florida for the most part. And there's many different types of salvia, um, both native and non-native. Those are all good for beneficial insects. And also society garlic, they have the little um, purple flowers that shoot up in the summer and fall. And that's a good one too. So let's talk about native perennials. So um, the black-eyed Susan, sometimes it grows more of an annual and kind of reseeds itself. Um, also the goldenrod that gets those big spikes of yellow flowers and the insects love it. Um, liatris, which is, I thought that was pictured on the right, but actually maybe it's not liatris. Um, Pineland lantana is the native type of lantana that grows well in central Florida. And we also have the native porter weed. Um, it's more of a low growing than the non-native one and it gets the purple flower spikes. Um, the purple cone flower, the rouge plant, and that's good for shady areas as well as the wild coffee um, that gets the little clusters of white flowers and the red berries. And that's good for shady areas. So next we're gonna talk about shrubs. So when I think of insectary plants, I often just think of flowers, but there's also shrubs, trees, uh, vines, and palm trees that really have a lot of flowers that you might not even notice. Um, some of the ones that you might notice are like the azalea that have the pretty pink flowers in the springtime. Um, but some of the ones that you may not notice are the hollies, like pictured in the top, the Ilex glabra, which is one of our native hollies, and the flowers are just teeny tiny, but there's tons of flowers on these hollies, and the, they're even a good source of um, pollen and nectar for bees. You'll see um, like gallberry, um, gallberry honey for time to time available from your local beekeepers. Um, button bush is a good choice if you have a wet area or live by a lake or a pond um, that is native. The chaya is also edible. It's called a tropical spinach. And um, you have to be careful. It has the white milky sap. But again, this gets nice clusters of white flowers that are good for um, the beneficial insects. Um, elderberry pictured on the bottom, that's native, and you can also use the berries. Um, again, a huge umbel type flower with lots and lots of flowers. Um, the firebush, which is the orange one pictured on the right, that's also a good shrub, and that comes in uh, pure native variety or a native cultivar, which we call a native var, native var, um, where it's a dwarf cultivar of the native firebush. And it just grows um, not as high as the native one does, and it might be more appropriate for, you know, manicured looking landscapes. Um, also the jatropha, which is a 
large shrub, maybe a small flowering tree. It gets those hot pink flowers on it. A lionia or fetter bush that gets uh, pink or white flowers. That's a native one. I have some of that in my yard. And also viburnums, many types of viburnums have a lot of beautiful flowers that are also good for beneficial insects. Okay, on to the trees. So you look at this red maple tree pictured here on the right, and you don't automatically think that this is good for insects, but it is. And the time of the year that the insects like the red maple tree is when it's flowering in the spring. So if you look carefully, you'll see teeny, teeny little flowers, and there's many of them for a short period in the spring. And so that provides um, good food for the beneficial insects. So some trees that are good are the red maple pictured here, also dahoon holly, which is also native, the red bud, which is um, native and it grows, like Orlando is kind of like the south, southern border of it. So if you're a little bit north in Florida, red buds should do good for you. Um, sea grapes for coastal areas, also native. Magnolia, there's many types of magnolia. There's native ones, there's cultivars like the little gem magnolia. And those huge flowers are good for insects and a lot of them are fragrant too for our enjoyment. And then bottle bush, bottle brush, um, that gets the red fuzzy flowers and it's not native, but it is a good insectary plant. Good for the bees, the bees just love that one. So vines, including coral honeysuckle vine pictured on the right, and that is the hummingbird's favorite in my yard. I see hummingbirds quite often and they're always going after that coral honeysuckle. Also Virginia creeper, a lot of people, oh, it's a weed. How do I get rid of the Virginia creeper? Well, it's okay to get rid of some of it, but consider leaving some of the Virginia creeper for the wildlife and to attract beneficial insects to your garden because in the springtime it does have nice little clusters of flowers and it is a beneficial native plant. So don't just kill it all, leave some for the wildlife. Also the cross vine, um, the trumpet vine, and the passion vine, um, especially the Passiflora incarnata which is the native variety pictured here on the bottom with those beautiful flowers. All right, so wrapping it up with our plant species, we have the palms. And I think the saw palmetto is one of the most underappreciated plants. The saw palmetto is such an amazing plant because look at all those flowers in it. If you go out in the spring, summer when it's flowering, um, here pictured here, there's some love bugs on it, but the bees love it. And this plant is also adaptable for all of Florida's most extreme conditions. It can take intense drought. It can take flooding and wet soils like we get in the summer. And then also the cabbage palm, which is our state tree. And again, that gets similar. Um, beautiful flowers. And so if you do have some large palms and you're managing them, um, don't cut off the flowers until after they bloom. I understand some people don't like to you uh, have the fruit dropping, you know, on their driveway or something, but at least let them bloom. That way the beneficial insects can get the nectar and pollen from the flowers. And then you could trim off the dead flower head before it goes to seeds, although the seeds are good for um, wildlife too sometimes. So if you're in um, South Florida, the coconut palm, the royal palm will grow down there. Um, Central Florida, the jelly palm and the queen palm also grow. The jelly palm is a uh, cold hardy palm. So those of you up north, as well as the saw palm and the cabbage palm. And then grasses. Now grasses don't have beautiful flowers, but they do provide habitat for many be beneficial insects. So they need a home. They need to find shelter. And right down in the middle, you know, of the grasses where there's no disturbance, they can hide out there 
and they, that's where they can reproduce and lay their eggs and rear their young and be safe and sound. So um, cord grass is one of the native grasses. Fakahatchee grass, also native. Um, Fountain grass is not native, but it's a nice one. It's um, pictured a little further back in this picture, like the red one with the little spikes off of it. And then moly grass is the pink one pictured here. It gets these pink plumes in the fall. And then you can just give it a haircut like once a year. And also wire grass. Um, I know up in the Wakiva Springs area, there's a lot of wire grass in those forests. And that's also a good, it's a small little clumping grass for you could plant in your yard. Um, so I'll pause right here and see if we have any questions. If you have a question, you can ask in the chat box. Sure, we have we have one, uh, Tia. Um, so the question is, isn't the queen palm considered invasive? Okay, the queen palm, it does reseed. And actually my neighbor has a um, queen palm and it's seeded in my yard. So yes, it is an invasive, but it is also found you know, locally. So if you had a big one in your yard, I wouldn't just go cut it out because it is invasive, but I would allow it to grow. But you do have to be careful of it reseeding. Uh, let's see, someone said, is the Florida wisteria a good one also? Um, the Florida wisteria, I don't have that so much here in Central Florida, maybe a couple of them. Do you guys have that more in North Florida? We don't have much. We have some um, where uh -huh. we are. I know Maxine is on as well, so um, she may, may want to chime in too, but um, we have a little bit uh, up here, but not, not, as, not too much. We yeah, have that that gets the pretty purple flowers. Mm -hmm. There's Maxine. Yep, we have some around the Silver Springs area, but not a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know it gets um, beautiful purple flowers, so it probably is good for beneficial insects. Somebody wants to know if Sebastian is considered South Florida. Um, Sebastian Inlet kind of down there. Um, I'm in zone 9B and I'm in Orlando, so you're probably getting close to zone 10 down in Sebastian. So you're kind of on the border between the tropics and the subtropics, depending on climate change and our winters. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be all the questions at the moment, Tia. All right, well, let's move on to the next part. So next we're gonna talk about how to integrate these plants into your garden, either your vegetable garden or just your landscape in general. And so this is a picture of my vegetable garden. And so this was in the spring of this year where I have some squash and I'm growing some beans and I got some peppers and I have a deer fence up. And then on the outside of the fence is where I planted my insectary plants. You can see them flowering here, um, the pentas and the grasses, I grow lemongrass and some other native grass like a wood oats and lantana. And so they can either be planted within your vegetable garden or right outside of it. Um, depending on the insect, it will have a flight path of, you know, maybe just 500 feet up to even two miles. So it's really um, depending on the insect, but you want them in close proximity to where you want the pest control. And, you know, you can just scatter them all over your yard too. Um, so this is an example of a hedgerow planting. And so hedgerows are a permanent, like perennial planting of beneficial plants that will help provide food and shelter for the insects all year round and year after year. Um, so this video, I highly recommend it. You can look it up on YouTube. We're not gonna watch it right now, but the title is A Biological Control Buffet in the Salad Bowl of America. And this is a video done by the Agricultural Research Center in Salinas, California, where they're growing lettuce. And so aphids are a common problem on the lettuce. And so they plant these hedgerows 
And then they also companion plant with um, sweet alyssum within the lettuce plantings to help control the aphids to attract hoverflies and other beneficial insects. So they've had a lot of success um, doing that there. And that's by Dr. Eric Brennan with the ARS in California. So we can do the same thing here with hedgerows, um, just planting a permanent band of insectary plants, you know, maybe on the border of your property or on the border of your vegetable garden or your field, depending on how large your site is. And then we also want to remember some of the Florida friendly um, finishing touches for our gardens. So irrigation, um, you want to follow your local water restrictions. Perhaps you are allowed to water, you know, twice a day now in the summertime, only once a day in the wintertime um, using low flow water heads or drip irrigation. Also fertilizer in Orange County, we have a fertilizer ordinance that um, we are not fertilizing in the summertime between June 1st and um, September 30th. And so, and then when we do fertilize our lawn in the spring, in the fall, we want to use low phosphorus fertilizer because our soil already has a lot of phosphorus naturally occurring in it. So these are things that you can do for whatever type of garden you have um, for your lawn and your landscape to do them in a more environmentally sustainable way. Um, also mulching. Mulching helps to improve the weed, you know, like help manage weeds, prevent them from growing, but also improve the soil structure and keep the soil moisture in the soil. And it just looks pretty too. I like the way it looks. Um, we already talked about pesticide use. So um, reduce or eliminate your pesticides in these biological, you know, control with the beneficial insects will help you to do that. So when you notice you have an aphid problem, then your strategy now can be to wait for a couple weeks and let the beneficial insects come and take care of that problem for you. And then you can have a more ecological landscape that way. And so we want to maintain our garden, but not too neat. We want to allow, you know, some clumps of grasses or sticks in order to let these insects complete their life cycles and nest and have shelter. And then just keep adding new plants as needed. If something dies, then take it out and throw it in the compost pile and plant something else and try to keep something flowering on every part of the year. That way your insects can have food and shelter and really stay in your yard year round. So some resources that you could check out is our EDIS publications online. Also, there's one on natural enemies and biological control. Um, there's natural products for pests, and that will help you choose the least toxic pesticide if you do need to use a chemical control. And nectar plants, so more lists of plants similar to the ones that I had today, including some of those and maybe some that I didn't put up. And um, that concludes my presentation. So I would like to invite you to take the survey and you can scan this little QR code. Also follow me on Facebook at the Garden Florida Facebook page. And at this time, I'd like to take any more questions or comments. Thank you. Well, we, I learned a lot from you today. It was great. great. A great presentation. I love it. Thank you. And you're propagating the um, African, African blue basil. Yeah, African basil is waiting for you. <laughs> okay, great. I am not. I am not allowed to be in the premises because I am 65, uh -huh. 65 year old, and uh, so my uh, my folks, my team are are there, and I already told them about. Uh, your generous donation for the, for the cardamom. Oh, great.
So <laughs> they, they cannot wait, you know, they have the false cardamom and uh, they want the real one now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so there's just you. so many plants you can grow, you know, so share, yeah. share the love. So thank team. you so much for, uh, and then uh, I mentioned about even the, the ginger and the turmeric mm -hmm. is also a beneficial flower, but they only last a short period of time. That's, oh, yeah. probably, that's probably one of the things you don't have it on the list. Yeah, no, actually the gingers, and I have a galangal ginger, and I see the hummingbird go to that too, and the, the flowers of that last a little longer. So that's yeah, the galangal, yeah, they last, they last four months. Yeah, you're right. And thank you so much. I meant to thank you personally. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, and so let's see, the first one is, is there a particular plant to attract ladybugs? Do they have a host plant? Okay, um, to my knowledge, and I'm not a bug expert, but ladybugs like all kinds of plants. So they come to feed on the aphids and I find that they like um, plants in the coffee family, like the, the wild coffee. And um, when I lived in Hawaii, they loved the noni plant. And I just find them kind of all over on random things. Do, do either of you have any more? Yeah, I would agree. Um, if there's aphids, there's ladybugs. <laughs> so um, there, that's going to be your best bet. I, I can always find them on um, Podocarpus because the oh, Podocarpus yeah. always has aphids always on Always have it. aphids. Yeah. So, but they don't have a particular plant. And then if you do choose to order them, which you can, um, one, make sure you're getting the right kind because we do have some that um, are considered more invasive than others. Uh, and then just keep in mind that, that once the food source is gone, they can leave, which is why Tia was talking about having flowers and, and attracting these insects year round. Um, next question, what beneficial insects kill leaf miners? Oh, I was just reading a publication on that. It's, I believe it is the parasitic wasps that kill the leaf miners. Yeah. And it's in one of those UF IFAS um, EDIS publications. If you look for leaf miners, it, it will have some different species of biological control insects in there. And they were most in the Hymenoptera, you know, which is the wasp and the bees kind of family yeah. of insects. Uh, next question, is the praying mantis native to Florida? How do I attract more to my yard? So we, we do have several that are native. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see praying mantis so often. I do see the brown one more commonly than the green one. And I'm not, I'm not really sure of anything specific to attract them. Yeah, I would agree. Um, there's around three species in Florida that I know of. There might be a few more. Um, there's one that looks like oak tree bark and it's very difficult to find. Um, it's typically up higher in your trees. Um, and so it, it needs that particular host canopy to, ha to, to live there. Um, and you've got the smaller ones that are either green or brown that are, look more like a stick bug. Um, but yeah. again, as far as attracting them, it's kind of a nat that's kind of a natural, you have to have the right ecosystem going on. Let's see. Oh, they want to know about lemongrass. Does it grow well in zone 9B? And does it get attacked by bugs? All right. Well, I'm in zone 9B and I have lemongrass in my yard and it does very well. And I, I can propagate that by like root divisions. And I have absolutely no pests problem. The deer don't eat it. Um, it's a great plant for zone 9B. Great. And last comment um, slash question. Somebody had fennel. They said it was covered in aphids and the ladybugs showed up. So um, fennel might be one of those. those good oh, ones. good job. And there was uh, some research done on how long does it take for the ladybugs to show up after the aphids. And I think the research said about like two weeks. So just be patient and let nature do its work. 
And then um, we have another question that came in. Any uh, suggestion in the Orlando area for a nursery that has a good selection of native plants? Um, so I'm also in the Orlando area and I usually go to the nearest plant nursery, which to my knowledge is the Green Isle Gardens over in Groveland and they have a great selection. Their nursery is really well done and they are open seven days a week, I believe, Green Isle gardens in groveland florida okay um somebody has little geckos in their yard do they help control bad bugs i'm not a gecko expert but i think the geckos just eat all bugs yeah yep somebody said green isle gardens okay that's all i have any more questions last call If not, I did put the survey in the chat and let me do it one more time. There's the survey link again. So please um, go ahead and, and click on that. Um, once we close the meeting, uh, that link will go away. So if you could do that for us. Um, and then if you are interested in next week, um, we are giving a, a talk on gardening with chickens. So that's a, a hot topic right now. And we have our livestock agent will be joining us um, to talk about that as well. So uh, if you yeah. haven't signed up for that yet, please do so. And uh, this will be, yes, urban urban chickens. So a garden with chickens. So they could be urban chickens or country chickens, <laughs> either, mm -hmm. either way. Um, and then I did put the, the survey or the link for all of these videos um, at the beginning. Uh, these can always be found afterwards. Uh, and if you can't find that link, you can email myself, Tia, or Maxine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the chickens, that, that's like another type of biological pest control. True. Or, I don't know if biological, but they definitely eat some of the bad bugs, so. Yeah. And the good bugs. <laughs> yeah, those are the, uh, all the bugs. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll help till up your garden too, 